Good morning, folks. We've got a full slate of news coming today from beneath our feet out into deep space. Had part three of our special series come out last night, but here we are starting with our star at spaceweathernews.com. We find the last 24 hours on the Earth facing half of the sun were relatively quiet. Bright active regions contrast with the dark polar coronal holes, and while the equatorial spots continue their rotation, we continue to see new groupings on the north come into activity. What's supposed to be a slow ramp up to flaring the sunspot cycle might not have to wait the normal year or two at this rate of development. Quick look at the solar wind, which wasn't exactly ferocious to begin with, but now purple plasma speed in the middle is dropping out this morning into quieter territory and the KP index looks to be setting a spell here amidst the weaker solar wind. Let's begin the science news with fracking. I'll be the first to admit my passion for pointing out the dangers of fracking, but also admit that the safety standards put in the last few years make me think they were listening to all of you. Now that goes a step further with advanced monitoring of potential seismic triggering, which should allow them to stop or slow if they are about to trigger an earthquake. Speaking of quakes, let's go back to 2011, Japan, the 9.0. They have now assimilated every jot and tittle of the crust in the days leading up to it. Not even a minuscule tremor was left out. And what they found was a wobble. The entire region shifted one way, then shifted back. And as it swung again the other direction, it lost its catch on the diving plate beneath it, and it thrust upward for the quake. They say they might be able to spot these while they're ongoing, before the big break. A fun and encouraging fact up next. They continue to find a pattern in ancient civilization. The groups that were able to survive what appears to be significant environmental changes in their regions were the ones with the largest diversity of culture. They noticed that bone remains indicate broad diets and activity levels among the groups that were not wiped out. We've never been more diversified culturally than we are now, and that's got to make you smile. Up next, we're moving out to space where the Kepler-88 system has a new giant. Well, not really new, just newly discovered to us. The Jupiter-sized planet needed to get in front of the central star and other inner planets before anyone was going to spot it. Interestingly, they say they were able to notice its effect on the light curve indicated orbits of the inner planets as well. It is wobbling the entire system. Up next, folks, we're going to see Orion like we've never seen him before. We've had zoom-ins. We've had fly-throughs with both visible and infrared light. But we've never had one like today's release. You ready? Here it is. Are you feeling underwhelmed? That's okay. Probably we're expecting pretty colors and high definition, but in reality, this is Hubble's first attempt to focus on the 1.4 micron return from the nebula, which is the spectral indication of water. Folks, the white you see here is water in Orion. Wow. Shake it off for a moment here as we come to another attempt to suggest charged dark matter might be playing a role in cosmology. Yeah, it's called plasma, and you think it's dark because you just don't see it very well in the heavens. But hey, if they are going to just randomly make stuff up, why not add some electric charge? At least that's not an all-out sprint in the wrong direction. Something super cool up next, the asymmetric ejecta of the Assassin 18FV Nova event. The more Nova we are able to spot in the cosmos, the more we find these asymmetric polar blast Nova with tremendous structure within the macro scale hourglass. Our last two stories are sticking with electromagnetism and we're first seeing that thunderstorms may do more to contribute to isotope production and ground deposition than we realized. Now the particle acceleration in a lightning flash causes runaway electron avalanche events that create X-rays and gamma rays, which together with the electrons are producing isotopes. Now while they think this can help their lightning mapping and understanding, my mind immediately jumps to the non-homogeneous distributions of isotopes across the world that don't seem to allow perfect matching up of geophysical phenomena in history. Well, in addition to the fact that major solar blasts over time only hit one half of the planet, now imagine extreme storm production due to that extra solar energy. You'd have to ramp up the isotope production of the lightning strikes as well. What we think could have taken a year to accumulate in a region, given a normal weather scenario, could be the isotope production of one lightning storm triggered by a solar flare. Last but not least, rocky planets with volcanoes triggered by magnetic induction from the star. The paper is meant to be very general, but it also has major implications for Earth. 
obviously. Both high cosmic rays and extreme solar magnetic activity have been shown to be proliferative of volcanoes on this planet, and now we actually have a mechanism for how the latter works. By the way, Earth's weakening magnetic field is not a good thing in this volcano situation either. Folks, last night we put out part three of solar superstorms. It's the timing and risk level for flaring in the coming cycle, and about half today's stories were related to it. We greatly appreciate your support. We've got wind map forecasts and shots of our start to close, and of course, we'll do this all again tomorrow. Right here, but right now, it's 4.45 a.m. in the new Valley of the Sun. Eyes open. No fear. Be safe, everyone.